Welcome to our continuing series of webinars that are focusing on the best practices for closing the pandemic learning gap in our Ohio schools. This webinar will focus on how our educators are dealing with that learning gap issue created by the pandemic in our, in our high schools. We have a great lineup of panelists that will address this issue during this hour-long webinar. My name is Jeff Good. I'm the Chief Education Technology Officer for PBS Western Reserve in Kent, Ohio. We're fortunate to have received funding for this project through the Broadcast Educational Media Commission in collaboration with the Ohio Department of Education. All of our webinars, the accompanying podcasts, and supportive resources can be found on our website that you see along the bottom of your screen. We're on YouTube Live tonight, so if you're attending uh, this live event remotely and have any questions, feel free to drop them in the live chat or um, you'll see a QR code um, in the corner of your screen Capture that QR code with your, with your phone. That'll take you to a form and you can ask your questions and we'll really do our best to share your questions with our panelists throughout the webinar. So uh, let's get started. Graham Wood is the graduation and college and high school administration, administrator rather at the Ohio Department of Education. He helps to manage Ohio's high school graduation requirements and has recently taken up a leadership role in the implementing the College Credit Plus from the state level. Graham is a product of Ohio education, graduating from high school in Toledo, attending The Ohio State University, and starting off his career as a Teach for America Corps member in Dayton, Ohio. Graham has been with ODE for almost five years now, and he currently lives in Columbus. Dr. William Young is in his 20th year as high school principal at United Local High School in Hanoverton. That's in Columbiana County, Ohio. In total, Dr. Young has over 24 years of school administrative leadership experience, in addition to having served as band director prior to becoming a principal. Dr. Young received his master's degree in 1998 and his doctorate in edu educational leadership in 2017 both from Youngstown State University. He has presented at, at numerous regional and state conferences, including the SST Region 5 Regional Summit, the OLAC, which is the Ohio Leadership Advisory Council Conference, and the Battelle Conference. He has served as a presenter and panelist for educators working on their principal's license at the University of Mount Union, and he has taught a master's level course online for Mount Union. In 2011, Dr. Young was part of the U.S.-China Administrative Exchange Program, visiting China in 2011 and 2014 in developing a sister school partnership um, with China and the United Local High School. At United Local, he also serves on the Community Scholarship Foundation and the Wall of Fame Committee. Apart from school and whenever he has the free time, I don't know how he does that, he is a board member for the Salem Regional Medical Center and is also a session elder for the new Lisbon Presbyterian Church. Dr. Young not only enjoys riding his bike and performing with the Salem Community Band, but also his brass quintet called Sassa Brass. He's married with two children, a son who is a teacher in Pittsburgh and a daughter who is currently attending Kent State University. Emily Randolph is currently in her 18th year, believe it or not, at East Palestine School, having taught English 9 and English 12, as well as CCP, drama, yearbook, history of film, mythology, and uh, EPTV. Emily possesses an undergraduate degree from Ohio Northern University in Communication Arts, a master's degree in teaching, and is currently pursuing a certification in school counseling through Westminster College. As an educator, Emily has served as the department chair is on both the building and district leadership teams and is a PBIS committee member and is also actively involved in numerous community and school organizations. Emily's passion is helping students pursue their dreams and realizing their goals. Through career development and college readiness for all learners, Emily strives to help those students explore options and plan for the future. Ann Kenton Lee, or Kenny Lee, is the Executive Director of Accelerated and Extended Learning for Columbus City Schools, a new position that focused on innovation and research-based practices to accelerate all CCS students. He oversees the offices of learning technology, gifted, career tech education, 
licensure, and adult education. Kenny began his career in Westerville City Schools, where he was a secondary social studies teacher, teaching both AP American and comparative governments. He later went on to serve as an assistant principal, social studies curriculum specialist, and an innovation coordinator. In 2019, Kenny became the director of secondary uh, curriculum and instruction and helped lead Columbus schools through the pandemic with a variety of academic acceleration initiatives, including the development of curriculum priorities, summer experience focused on engagement, and virtual and hybrid teaching and learning frameworks. In every role that Mr. Lee holds, his focus is on increasing that equitable access to uh, rigorous curricula, closing those learning gaps, and developing critical and growth mindsets among his students. So now that we've had a chance to meet our panelists, um, let's, let's take a little closer look before we begin that discussion. And let's focus on where our schools and educators have been for the last two years, the pandemic and the shutdown of school buildings, and a move to that remote learning have really made our teachers face a new education landscape of uncertainty, frustration, and lots of Zoom. Let's take a closer look. When California went into lockdown last March, teachers saw their worlds turned upside down. What everyone thought would be a short hiatus from in-person learning turned into a year and counting. In-person lessons were quickly converted into Zoom teaching. It became a year of trial and error. While they've gotten most students to come around, these teachers have also learned that their students need to be with each other, and their teachers need to be able to walk past their desks and see how they're doing today. Oh, how would I describe this last year? It's definitely been trial and error. I think in the beginning, I was working really hard to try to figure out what worked in distance learning and what felt accessible and doable for students. I think the spring actually really helped us to prepare and gave us a, a taste of what was going to happen when we were supposed to shut down for two weeks. It's been a year now officially. We've had students from day one that want to be in the classroom. A lot of students that say that they just don't learn online. You know, a lot of students need to be in there asking questions. They need to touch, feel, and such, whereas the online, they're not getting that. When we were in person, you know, I would see a kid and you could just pick up on how they were feeling and their energy just by looking at them. But now that like I'm looking at them through a computer screen, sometimes they don't have their cameras on. It's hard to just gauge like where students are at. Are you not coming because something's going on at home, because you don't want to, because you don't have internet or a computer? Or... This is so many factors that you can't figure out. Some families that are, you know, stuck on hard times, some homeless, some that, you know, don't get food outside of what we provide them at school. So it's hard to expect those kind of students to come to class and do work when they don't have their basic needs, you know, being met first. I'll have students that will turn on the camera and, and I see the top of their head on the roof. For, for teachers, it's just, sometimes it's just, you know, are they there, are they listening, are they engaged in the activity? I can't assume that they're able to see or hear anything I'm saying because of the connectivity issues. Distance learning, honestly, my motivation has kind of declined a bit, if I'm honest. Like, every morning I used to, you know, get ready and get myself ready, but you know, there's times where I just wear pajamas to school <laughs> and I just don't feel like doing anything. I have some kids who are really thriving with distance learning. I think that they're not so distracted by some of like the drama that can happen at a high school campus. They're just focusing on themselves and their academics. A lot of it has to do with whether they are self-motivated, if they have support at home, if they have a quiet place to work. I mean, I have students that uh, they'll turn on their camera and they're making a sandwich for their siblings. Basically, all you have to do is have dedication, motivation just to do your work and to have a good balance of what you should do. I've always been in AP courses and I've pretty much spent more time on AP courses because of distance learning. Uh, what's your GPA? Uh, 4.6 weighted, 4.0 if it's not. 
Really, I just want to be successful in life, get somewhere in life. Since I was little, I've always been a hard worker, so you know, I just do my best and I try to excel at whatever I can. I'm actually really proud of how my students have been adapting and how they are, you know, rising to the challenge of this school year and, and they've actually been pretty successful, you know, turning in their work and following along and, and participating in discussions and I feel like they're still learning. This year I'm teaching books that are speculative fiction or science fiction um, themed. So I'm teaching The Handmaid's Tale with my seniors and Parable of the Sower by Octavia Butler with my juniors. The conversations are still rich. They look different now, for sure. Talk about like dystopia. It's been really amazing just being able to like talk to students about how they see the parallels between the stories that we're reading in our current worlds and just like, what can we do differently so that our futures don't end up like this? I mean, I've had kids taking care of their parents that have COVID. So as far as like missing assignments, you have to give more leniency in, in, in them turning those in. And then I talk to students over and over and over again about their missing assignments. So it's like whack-a-mole with, with, the, with the assignments. And so that's been very challenging, and, and, but that's where I've seen the most bang for my buck is that a lot, a lot of their grades are better because of me taking that, that time to really work with students individually more. I'm a pretty creative person and I used to teach art. And so that hands-on making projects and even just like drawing together, I miss that a lot. And having the kids um, work together, and it's really hard to do that now. So I pulled most of my classes, and at least 50% of the kids want to come back in person. At this point, the way I see it is these kids need to be around other kids. I want to come back, but it depends on my mom because obviously we don't want to, we don't want me coming back contaminated or anything like that. I'm not a parent, but I understand the urgency to return to school because it's impacting all of our students' mental health and their wellness. And also like we're not going to do it until it's safe for everybody. I do miss being in the classroom. One, it, there's a lot more time to teach, so it's not like 40 minute intervals where you don't get as much out of it. And there's also the aspect of, you know, having friends that you can talk to. That's kind of been kind of gone. Parents are supposed to be parents and they're supposed to have their own job and they're not supposed to be teachers. They're not supposed to be childcare unless that's their job, but you know that they shouldn't have to do that on top of everything else that they do in the house. And so I understand the frustration and I, I understand why they would want to come back. Um, I don't think they understand everything that it entails and like all the challenges just setting up your classroom to have it safe. Teachers are still working. Like are there teachers out there who are probably like, oh, this is a nice little break for me, right? I don't need to be as engaged or involved as I could, as I need to be, right? I'm not gonna lie, like there are definitely teachers like that. And I would say like the majority and overwhelming majority of teachers that I work with are putting in way more hours than we ever have. Lesson planning, reaching out to students and families, doing home visits, creating lessons that are engaging online so that kids don't feel alone um, and still feel like they're being challenged. Then you take for granted these the such little things like you know, writing something on paper and pencil or like walking past a kid and, and, and being able to help them or, or, you know, pat them on the shoulder and how's your day going? You know, we, it's hard to do that now. And so the, those connections and, and those little things that I think taking for granted is, you know, I don't know if we'll take that for granted anymore. Teachers have always been vilified. We're either the heroes and the martyrs or we're just super lazy people, right? If you can't do, then teach, I think is the saying, but I'm not really worried about people's critique because I'm doing the work. Come through and see, like <laughs> the invitation is open. So that's all I have to say about that. And welcome back. My name is Jeff Good. I'm with PBS Western Reserve, and we've got a, an esteemed panel 
of uh, high school folks that are dealing with and uh, the pandemic learning gap um, in our high schools. Our first panelist is Graham Wood. He's the graduation and college and high school administrator um, with the Ohio Department of Education. Graham, I know we've we've talked quite a bit and you've shared a lot of information. Um, talk to us a bit about about your role and and what high schools are dealing with in this and helping to address that learning gap. Yeah. So. Thanks, Jeff. Really appreciate you having me today, and really interested in in uh, you know this this subject, and and hope it's you know incredibly helpful to folks. I know uh, our other panels will probably be a little more helpful in the the actual details of what's going on in schools than me. Um, but from the state perspective, you know my role has really been in in supporting folks and and providing flexibility, as we know there's been a lot of variability in, in the experiences that students have had over the last couple of years. Um, we, we know what things looked like, uh, you know, for the first few months, schools were closed. Um, and, and that year there was a, a ton of flexibility um, that was provided and then, and then some varied flexibility in the following year when the experiences for students were varied. Um, but the other kind of big piece of this for me is that this pan pandemic, excuse me, um, probably couldn't have come at a worse time thinking about my my main job of graduation requirements. Um, you know, so I work uh, at the department in the Office of Graduate Success um, and, you know, graduation requirements are one thing that we work on. Um, but, you know, in 2019, in the summer, um, we finally started to see some calming in the world of graduation. Um, you know, for many years, there had been transitions. There had been flexibilities provided. There had been new requirements pulled in. Um, but through the state budget in the summer of 2019, we were given a set of um, what we, we, you know, commonly referred to as permanent or long-term graduation requirements. And many of you are hopefully very familiar with those because they're the requirements that will be required for next year's seniors, this year's juniors. Um, they would require students to earn their 20 credits. They would require students to uh, you know, demonstrate competency and to earn two seals on their diploma. Um, and as the 2019-2020 the school year um, led on, we went through the process at the department uh, and my predecessor in this role went through the process of ironing out the details, getting everything worked out. And we were telling people for a long time throughout that year, you know, hold on, you know, more information's coming. We're working through the interpretations. We're going to get you more information. And uh, on March 1st of 2020, we finally posted um, a huge amount of information about those long-term graduation requirements, really ironing out all of the details and, you know, giving folks a few years through with which to implement all of this information. And I think we all know what happened about two weeks later was that folks in schools weren't necessarily focused on what was going to be coming into play three years from then. They were focused on right now. What can we do today? And two years later, we have folks that are in a very similar situation. Um, so the other thing that we have been focusing a lot on is how to uh, encourage folks to begin thinking about these new long-term graduation requirements. And uh, it seems like folks are, are starting to come around and, and have time to really dig into this now which is a really important time because time is, is, is running out for these students that are gonna be graduating next year. Um, so, you know, these students are, are juniors this year are gonna be graduating uh, next year. They, they have had two full years of education. Um, you know, almost all of their high school careers has been impacted by the pandemic. Um, and they're expected to meet a set of graduation requirements that are new. So, so our job is to communicate. Our job is to talk through that with folks, and that's what we have been trying to do through through a couple of efforts, um, you know, that we've been been working on lately. Now, Graham, you talk about these students, and and it's it may be an unfair question, but um, obviously you're you're dealing with the students as you talked about schools being flexible, but students that um, were in were seniors right at the beginning of the pandemic and spent their senior year basically remote learning and in a whole new world. And then you talk about your students that may have been sophomores in, in 2020 that are now, you know, juniors and seniors. What's the, what's the different type of preparation that you're helping that student that was a senior during the, during the onslaught and, and what support have you given to those students, you know, to help them through that? So uh, you mean the differences in, in what kind of, you know, what's been done for each set of yes. students? Absolutely. 
Yeah, and you know, there would probably be, you know, the folks in schools will be able to speak better to exactly what's been done on the school level. Um, you know, for for students that have been, um, you know, going going to school and and you know, working on meeting their graduation and requirements throughout this process. Um, there's been multiple years of, of, of flexibility that have been provided. So for those seniors um, that last year, you know, that that school building closure happened before many schools were able to get, you know, any state testing started or done. Um, so state testing was canceled that year. Um, so any student was provided flexibility to use their grade that they had in that course that they were in that year to substitute for their end of course test score. So any sophomore, junior, senior, or freshman, um, and even students that were outside of those grades but were scheduled to take an end of course test had some flexibility so that they didn't need to worry about retaking that test at some point in the future. That same flexibility existed for last year's juniors and seniors. Um, so that means that this year's senior class um, had that flexibility for the last two years. There was a little bit of a gap where next year's seniors um, didn't have that flexibility last year. Um, so hopefully they were able to take their tests or were able to make those up at some point over the last couple of years. Um, but for both years, there was significant flexibility as well in terms of the graduation requirements, because we knew that these students were focused on, you know, a number of other things. Um, and, you know, the state legislature understood that and, and you know, provided flexibility for students in both years um, so that, you know, students who were impacted in different ways from the pandemic wouldn't be held back from not graduating simply because of the, the different circumstances that existed. So the flexibility that was offered, you know, allowed students to use simply their curriculum requirements to meet the graduation requirements for the last couple of years. And that's going away this year. There isn't that flexibility that's been offered for students. So we're having our first year again of students having to meet the full set of graduation requirements. So as we did your introduction, we talked about your role now with the College Credit Plus um, mm -hmm. how does that, how, how long have you been in that program and, and what are some effects you're seeing on, on your work in that program related to the, to the pandemic? Because we've got a, you know, we've got a, a webinar coming up I, and I've kind of shifted the schedule a little bit. So it'll be in April that talks about how, how schools are dealing with that high school to college, um, transition. And so some of your thoughts on that, now that, that role of that, that other role that you play. Yeah, and you know that 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 opportunity for students to get um, you know that little dip into the 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 world of what may be next for them is is incredibly important. Um, you know, our our the office that I work in, the Office of Graduate Success. You know, graduation requirements are just one piece. We are really working on that transition into whatever is next for that student, and you know, really encouraging schools to be thinking about that, um, whether that is college or not. College Credit Plus can be a great opportunity for students to experience um, what life might be like after high school and to test the waters on, on what may uh, be their path after high school. Um, so College Credit Plus has, has you know, tried its best to, uh, to provide flexibility as well over the last couple of years. Um, one of the, the key flexibilities that, provided, that it provided was around student eligibility testing wasn't available, so students could use their GPA. Um, we also saw a huge shift, like we've seen in, in all these you know, situations, to online learning. Um, you know, just as colleges shifted to online learning, we saw students double the amount of online coursework that they were engaging with um, you know, directly through the college with College Credit Plus. Um, what I find really interesting is, is thinking through how that's going to look after this year, you know, is that going to be a trend that continues and we continue to see a significant increase in that online learning um, or, or are we going to go back to uh, the, the numbers like we had uh, beforehand with a shift back, um, you know, but College Credit Plus as a program still grew uh, under the pandemic um, over the over the last couple of years. We've still seen an increase in students accessing um, early college uh, and, and specifically that credit that they get through College Credit Plus. Um, so really, you know, pleased with students still being able to access the program. Um, and I think, you know, we, we owe a lot of credit to to our institutions of higher education as well for adapting and showing some flexibility to allow students to, to access that. I, I keep using this word flexibility, but it really has been, from the state perspective, the name of the game um, for the past couple of years because 
you don't know what students are going through. You don't know what's happening in a different school. And, you know, things may, you know, look completely normal in one community and, you know, look completely different, uh, you know, even just a couple counties over. So thinking through what flexibility can be provided throughout the state has really been the, the main focus. Graham, thank you so much. Obviously, flexibility is is a key word here. And uh, as we progress through the rest of our panelists, I think um, you'll it'll be interesting for you to see what some of our districts are doing in being flexible with those Absolutely. high school students. So once again, thank you so much for your time and uh, keep doing the great things that you're doing, you, you and your folks at the Ohio Department of Education. We certainly appreciate all that you do. So thank you so much. Thanks for having me, Jeff. Appreciate it. So our next uh, panelist is Dr. William Young from United Local. He's the high school principal. Um, Bill has been um, instrumental in talking about quite a bit about what has been going on at United Local. So I'll give you the give you the floor, Dr. Young, and talk a little bit about how how United Local and and the folks that you've dealt with how they've been dealing with that learning gap that was created by your by that pandemic um, that whole that whole pandemic situation. Sure. Uh, thanks, Jeff. And, and first, just to give a shout out to Graham down at ODE, uh, working on the front line with uh, all of the graduation requirements, the changes that are taking place, uh, and the flexibility that he mentioned. We certainly appreciate the flexibility and the accommodations that they've made over the past couple of years with the pandemic. Um, they've, they've been responsive. And I do think that the new graduation requirements give us the tools uh, better than anything we've seen in the past to help students be successful in diverse ways. As we know, every kid's different. Every kid has a different path and a different way that they're they're approaching their, their post high school career. So a uh, shout out, I think some real good things are going on down at ODE. So I wanna talk about some things that we need to be doing in schools and in the classroom, but first maybe to understand the, prob the problems and frame those as they relate to learning loss and the pandemic. Um, it's not something that, that just happened last year and then this year we're gonna fix it. So this has been going on uh, since the pandemic started. It's continuing this year. There is additional learning loss taking place this year. And that's for a variety of reasons, including uh, the fact that we started behind the game at the beginning of this year because of last year. But then we also had things going on this year. We had a lot of kids who were quarantined for a lot of days. We had uh, some online learning going on, not as much as last year. Uh, so there's been a lot of obstacles that have continued that pattern of, uh, of learning loss. And they were telling us last year that we should expect about four years to recover from this issue of learning loss. And it has continued into this year. So we know that this is a process. It's not something that happens overnight. Uh, so, But first of all, thinking about a high school setting and the types of classes that we have, we have... Uh, what we call them, uh, discrete or standalone courses, courses that you take once. Uh, they're not, they don't require any type of uh, prerequisite skills or knowledge for the classroom. And once you're done with that class, you're done with that class. And that might be something like a psychology class or a health class um, or an astronomy class. These are classes that you take and when you're done, you're done. And they're usually elective courses in, in many cases. But then we also have sequential courses. And this is where real problems start to occur in the curriculum in schools. And that would be going from, for example, Spanish one to Spanish two to Spanish three or algebra one to geometry to algebra two. These sequential courses built on skills and knowledge that are needed in order to be successful at the next level. So we know coming in at the beginning of the year, we cannot start Spanish three where we would normally start Spanish three. That curriculum, the standards for Spanish three has to be approached in a different way. We have to identify where those real gaps are taking place um, and find ways to remediate those. Now, this isn't something completely new to teachers because we know when we come back at the beginning of every year pre-pandemic that there's some learning loss that takes place over the course of the summer. And we have to address that um, and we have to find ways to, to, to solve those problems because we can't just build on top of something that isn't strong as a foundation. And even classes like uh, uh, chemistry that require some uh, math and algebra, there's gonna be things that have to be identified and through that process then addressed within the classroom. So how do we do this? How do we identify where these gaps or these losses are? Well, we have data from the end of course exams, item analyses, 
and uh, all the pieces that come out of that that we look at every year to try to shore up our curriculum. But we're going to see more glaring examples of specific things that that teacher might need to address that probably should have been taught the previous year or at least the students come out with a stronger sense of it from the pre previous year than what they do as a result of the pandemic. We also have value added data, which is really good at uh, helping us see individual students where their trends and projections are as far as how they're going to perform in the class. So that's that's a really powerful tool that we've been using and has been helpful with this process. Uh, teachers use unit pretests as a way to gauge what do their students know um, and, and what do they need to know for going forward. And there's also some tools that came out from ODE uh, through the readiness restart package. And one of them that is, is, I think one of the better ones is the benchmark assessments. And those are aligned to the standards. So that give us an idea, that gives us an idea of, okay, where do we need to go as a teacher for this class in order to move, to move forward so that our kids can be successful. Um, I like the idea of a uh, summer algebra boot camp. We're kind of talking about that. We need to find a way to present these solutions in positive ways because with high school students, the real challenge is getting them to come out to these extra things that we're going to do. So whether it's a, a STEM camp, a STEAM camp, or something that brings them in, uh, we know that, that this is one way that we can do some remediation. I also like the, the Alex math program. We've been using this for a number of years and, and colleges even use this. Alex is an individualized program that allows and assesses students where they are, finds gaps and moves them forward through modules. And you can use it in any, any of the math uh, courses or all the way from elementary up through high school and in college as well. So that's a great way for math to deal with that. I also wanted to talk a little bit, though, about the the loss, and, and we've been having conversations about this um, amongst the staff, the loss of grit and determination and this uh, desire to embrace and overcome challenges, because this has become a real thing. And it's not new. There were always some kids who, you know, when, when things got tough, they just kind of, eh, I'm not going to do this. this. This isn't for me. But we see more of this. It's almost prolific right now as a result of the pandemic and some of the things that students have dealt with um, where they, uh, whether it's because of lack of internet or whatever, we know that during the pandemic, everything has become three times harder. Um, and those things, the lack of routine, consistency, the need for face-to-face -face instruction, the removal of real due dates or deadlines, which made it hard for kids to establish a sense of accomplishment with their academics. And for many students, this has resulted in a tendency to give up when the going gets tough. And so we're recognizing this and having to find ways to scaffold in uh, these programs to help kids want, have the desire to want to overcome things when it gets hard. Uh, and that's, that's a real thing that we're, we're working on. We've been working through our PBIS team with this. We've been talking with our teachers about this. Um, and so something that, again, is not new, but has really become um, uh, bright in, in our eyes, if you would, uh, with the pandemic is these things that we know that we need to do for 21st century skills. And we've been talking about these for a number of years, but it's really glaring at us right now because when the pandemic hit, we went to a lot of this remote instruction and we actually went backwards. We, as, as teachers in the classroom, we became more teacher centered and less student centered. Uh, in part because it was more efficient and we're trying to catch up ground that we've lost, in part because we're on Zoom meetings or Google Classroom meetings with Google Meet and doing things along that line. So this is a, a, a real challenge uh, that we're facing with uh, being able to engage students. And so that student engagement piece is probably underlying everything else that is going on. Uh, we have been doing some work with UDL, Universal Design for Learning, prior to the pandemic, and we spent a whole year through our TBTs in the process of school improvement, working with the, the strategies to uh, improve student engagement, um, whether it's project-based learning, uh, making connections to real-world applications, giving students choices, uh, even things like uh, book clubs, which actually comes from the literacy collaborative model, where students get together and select their book within our group, and then they get together and talk about those books within the classroom so that you're giving some students some choice. This is all part of what we refer to as uh, ownership of learning and education, and students need to have ownership of, of their learning. It's part of uh, this, this phenomena of Gen Zers, if you will, and, and probably one of the best uh, authors out on the topic of 
everything from millennials to Gen Zers is uh, Tim Elmore. He's written a number of books on this and uh, a great, great expert on the psyche of teenagers today. Gen, Gen, Zers, Gen Zers are uh, basically age seven through 22 people, and they see the world differently because of having grown up with the uh, um, social media and the Internet and this uh, overflow of information. They have more information than anybody ever had in the history, but they don't have the experiences to go with that. So they also have a, a ton of naiveness about the information. And this creates a whole new uh, world for teachers uh, to to deal with when we're approaching kids. Um, so this idea of developing this ownership that kids need, they need to be able to have some choice in the process of their learning uh, as far as uh, deciding how they're going to show what they learned deciding what book they're going to read to learn the same things that they need to learn how to read within your English class. This is a, a powerful thing that we know we need to get back to. And as I said, we moved away from this because we didn't have face-to-face -face instruction. Social distancing told us that we, we couldn't put kids in groups. We need to keep people separated six feet, right? Right. Uh, <laughs> so that was a, a real challenge. And getting back to these practices is something that we'll be focusing on. I know for the start of next year, we're going to be going right back to uh, the student engagement component of universal design for learning as our uh, mantra for next year, because we kind of need to reteach that with our staff and get it underneath our belts, the same as we're reteaching things with our students in the classroom. You know, Dr. Young, you shared with us some some images of some of the programs, and I love the idea of, of and some of these are going to be images that, that talk about celebrating accomplishments. Um, but you've also, um, we also talk a little bit, or you shared some information and some images, and we can bring those up. We start talking about um, the re rebuilding that the vision efforts. Talk a little bit about that, um, you know, about what, what all that, and we'll step through these images and just tell us a little bit about each one. Yeah, so this this picture we're looking at right now here, this was our most recent staff in-service meeting, and this was an exercise that uh, we had some teacher leaders who put this together as a way to, uh, and if you could see the whole room, there were actually boards around the room in, in different teacher groups, and they were asked to answer questions such as, uh, what is the your best day in your classroom look like? And then they would ask a question, well, what does that looked like when you were a kid, what was your best day in the classroom? Those types of questions, they put the post-it notes up there, they talked about them, then they walked around and looked at those different charts with all those things on there, trying to get back to how do we make things so that kids are having a positive experience in school, positive experience in the classroom, that whole school climate piece and starting the discussion of what, what is education going to look like going forward? We're also in the process of planning for a new building, and that gives us the opportunities to design our new building around the uh, the needs of today, but also the unknown needs of tomorrow. But this starts with that building that vision of, of what what what's exciting and what makes a day good uh, for teachers and students. And so that's that we had a lot of fun with that, but it was also I think some powerful conversation. Dr. Young, I, uh, we're going to just kind of st skip through very quickly some of these accomplishment uh, videos or images here. Um, certainly appreciate your time. Certainly sounds like we're doing some wonderful things at United Local. Project-based learning there, yeah. You know, and, and certainly we appreciate your time. Um, all kinds of different things that I know are going on there. And I apologize. For that kind of, yep, absolutely. <laughs> and you've, But it's, it's celebrating those successes, and I think that's important. Thank you. It's all something and it's not just at United Local. Everyone is grappling with this and, and everybody's trying to find ways and we'll get there. That's what we do in education. Absolutely. Dr. Young, thank you so much. Um, we appreciate your time. Please don't go anywhere in case we have any questions. Um, but I wanted to move on. Our, our next panelist is Emily Randolph um, and she is a college and career based English teacher at East Palestine. Um, we, I think we've got Columbiana County pretty much covered here. Yeah. Um, Emily, thank you so much. Um, let's talk a little bit about what are some programs that you're you're working with at East Palestine um, in dealing with that um, that pandemic learning gap with your high school students. Thanks, Jeff. Um, first of all, I want to just say that Dr. Young did a really great job of highlighting some of the obstacles that we're seeing right now um, with student motivation or interest, um, making sure that they are getting what they need uh, from their teachers and from the curriculum as well. Uh, so what we've decided to do a little bit before the pandemic, um, we had a conversation with some of our students and realized that 
they were lacking um, or starting to lack a little bit of motivation in the area of, of academics. They felt like for some of our students, they felt like maybe they weren't exactly sure what they wanted to do or where they wanted to go next. Um, and everything in school felt like a push for college and they just weren't sure that that was the pathway for them. And so we took a long, hard look and had some really um, great conversation with a lot of our students about what does what does an education look like for every learner? What does a good, solid education provide for every individual, regardless of where they plan to go in the future? And we spent a lot of time having those conversations. So um, then the pandemic hit and it shut everything down. And like most schools, um, we weren't necessarily prepared um, with the technology pieces, um, different things that we could provide for our students. You know, how do we how do we feed our students? How do we make sure that all of our students, regardless of where they live, have access to the internet? Um, all of those things became a priority at that point. Um, making sure that they were that they were fed and that they were getting the education that that we could give them or provide at that time. Um, in coming back. We're, we're noticing a little bit of, of a different kind of student, to be honest. Um, so education has become a little bit different for them. They're looking for more of a relevance. They're looking for a little bit more of, of, of a reasoning. Give me a reason why. Why is this important? What do I need to know this for? for? What purpose is this going to serve in the future? And so we've been able to kind of take a step back and again readdress or think about some of the things that we um, were talking about prior to the shutdown. Um, what's really great about it is that with the state making some some changes and adding some different pathways for students for graduation, these seals and credentials and things have become have just become a part of what is ingrained within our system, and and that's helpful because we can support that. Um, a couple things that we have we have done within our district um, is we're really focusing on um, student engagement. We're really focusing on providing experiences and opportunities for students, whether it be through uh, virtual experiences or having people come in, job shadowing, um, those sorts of things. We have classes that are now not only focusing on the curriculum and the state standards, but maybe in a way through a career class. We have a career English, we have a career math that's providing students with the opportunities to get the same curriculum, but be able to apply it in an area that they're going to use it in the future, which is really helpful. It's it's interesting you make the comment about career English, and I and it was wonderful that you shared with us some some photos that you've taken of, of your students. And I hope you don't mind. We have an opportunity to share those, and you you led in well with your career English, and I was waiting for you to go there. Um, yeah. But talk a little bit. We'll we'll step through some of these slides, but just give us an idea of how you're making that connection at at East Palestine with that career English. I, I find that very fascinating. Okay, so this picture is um, is actually me and a colleague. We were um, asked to go in and do educator in the workplace. So we were invited into area companies. And I got to work a forty hour week over the summer to understand what they needed in an employee. Um, then in turn, we created a lesson plan together. Um, I created a lesson plan with the gentleman in the picture. He came into my classroom and he taught the soft skills that they're looking for when they're going through the employment process. So that was something that we could do together. It covered the speaking and listening standards. You know, we were able to kind of tie in the curriculum with how it would apply when they went on the job hunt, which was which was really great. And as we move on, oh, and we, I, I love a lot of these images because I, I was waiting for the explanation because they just they speak so strongly to this whole concept of career English. So I figured no one's better to talk about than you. Right. So in this, in this, we um, are now offering um, a building trades class, um, in which the students will be able to use their mathematics skills and their English skills um, in order to do building trades with an apprenticeship in um, carpentry, which is which is pretty incredible. Um, it's it's like kind of going backward, but finding a new way to do everything, which is which is really incredible. You know, bringing a shop class back, bringing you know a different type of family and consumer science that's teaching students about business. It's teaching them um, how to get their credentials so that it makes them more marketable when they go into the workforce. 
And I noticed a picture of, of these folks here. Talk a little bit about what, what that program was all about. Okay, so I also invite in, we invite in um, all of the military personnel. Um, so we focus a lot on the three E's. Here every Wednesday is a three E day. Um, so whether they're going to enlist, enroll, or employ, um, we have opportunities within my English classroom and in other classrooms to bring people in to kind of talk to the students about future, you know, possibilities or options that they may have. We feel like the more experience um, or exposure our students are getting, the better decisions they can make for their future. This looks like an interesting class here. This is robotics, robotics maybe? Yeah, possibly. this is our robotics class. Um, again, very hands-on, very, um, very academic. Um, and our students love the class. So they're learning, it's hands-on. <laughs> this is a cafe um, image. He's actually making me a hot chocolate, which Very is nice. free. <laughs> um, but they run our cafe um, and our cafe, all of the proceeds from our cafe go straight back to student activities and programming, which is really great. But they do all of the purchasing, they do all of the money, they take care of all of their advertising and they do um, all kinds of really great things and in turn they're able to help support some of the programming that they'd like to see in the school this is again we have that's the cafe um this gentleman is preparing for their opening for their sale for the day emily thank you so much i just love the whole concept of 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 career english it sounds like east palestine is doing some wonderful things we we certainly appreciate your time um and uh, just i any help we can give you, but we really appreciate it. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for having me. So before we move to our last panelist, Ohio's largest school district, Columbus City Schools, reignites and engages their students with an innovative summer school program. Corda Institute for Teaching trained educators to design and teach projects where students develop their skills and a deep knowledge while solving problems for local community partners. Students conducted research, they worked collaboratively, and they developed creative solutions for local organization. Before we move to our last panelist, let's take a closer look at what's happening at Columbus City Schools. They really didn't think that their voice mattered. And I think this opportunity gave them a chance to see that their voice really matters and their ideas count for a lot. I think about my math classroom, you always hear people say like, why does this matter? Why do I have to learn this? But you never hear them really say that in this type of class. You know, being a coach, being a teacher, we all want kids to reach their full potential. It's just a matter of them also <laughs> seeing it in themselves and preaching. Columbus City Schools is the largest school district in the state of Ohio. It's like six regular sized school districts all in one. During the normal school year, we had a lot of students who were just, they weren't engaged. And virtual had a big part of that. We were fully virtual for essentially three quarters of the school year. And that took a toll on a lot of our students, especially the ones who struggle. If we could engage these students, if we could get students to think about learning in a different way, but to also do authentic projects that would be meaningful to them, meaningful to their community, we felt like we could really accomplish our goal of increasing student engagement. Typically in person was four hours of um, just direct instruction in whatever subject the student needed. This summer, um, the summer experience was different and so through the quarter method we did the project-based learning where students were given a real problem, an urgent problem that a community partner had that they needed to help solve. And then throughout those three weeks did a bunch of different activities with them, um, lots of research, creating slides, presentations, and then at the end of the three weeks they would give their presentation to the partner. It was hard because they're used to people giving them the questions and giving them the answers. We gave them the questions and they had to go out and look at some varied answers to some of these problems that they were trying to solve. And I think they had some difficulty coming up with the right answers or realizing that there are some different solutions that they can use based on their research. Really, the crazy thing was like from project one to project two was the willingness of kids to reach out to other partners to try to partner already like on their own and we went from very baseline like saying hey partner with this group to help solve your problem instead it was we reached out to them like we talked to this person so it was really intriguing to see just how much more willing they were to put themselves out there uh to help someone else 
I looked at the surveys that we, we gave at the end. I think that was one of the options on the survey was, how do you view your teacher's role? And it was coach, coach, coach versus the person that you go to for information because we weren't lecturing all the time. We were engaging and taking them around and asking them questions. I have a, a set of knowledge, but I'm facilitating them to explore knowledge in their own direction. Essentially, I am a facilitator and a coach rather than just a teacher lecturing. Through doing that, they were able to learn the English and the math and the science and the social studies almost uh, undercover <laughs> without them knowing it. Uh, we were able to sort of sneak that in. So for math, for example, they were looking at data, they were looking at charts and graphs and finding the differences in percentages to see how something had grown. For science, we had a group that was looking at trauma-informed care and how trauma can affect the brain. And we had to look at the history of the Linden community. I know for a fact we definitely touched on all four core content areas. There's a lot of aspects of my teaching that's very streamlined, it's very standards-based, and I'm constantly wanting to figure out how can I implement skills. I want to put more meaning to what we're doing. I think this actually gave me a lot of ideas to take back with me when I go to teach in the fall. Well, I think it motivates them because it's a real relevant problem and typically students aren't asked to solve real adult challenges. Before coming here, I was like super quiet. Like even at other schools, people thought I didn't talk because I couldn't speak English. That's how quiet I was. In school, my goal was like, what, memorize stuff and just get the correct answer. My goal was to get an A. But here, my goal is to actually solve real world problems. And that forces me to, you know, be more active with other people and see what's going on in this world. It actually took my morning away, but something productive to do in the morning. Not just play around, not do nothing for the summer. I was actually going places, helping businesses, and doing all types of stuff. This, like, summer program gives you more freedom and creativity to like express yourself in the way you want to. You're gonna do the work, but you get to express your ideas and how you want to do them. It's helped me learn and grow because I feel like, like after school, I feel like I can really start helping people. I feel like I won't be stuck in like what I need, to, what I want to do. I feel like I want to help people. The kids were confident and the kids were successful and the community partners were impressed and it went well on every level. I think we underestimate our students sometimes, but they can do so many amazing things. And I think this program allows them to show us, you know, look what I can do. So you may have recognized someone in that video, and that's one of our panelists, Mr. Kenny Lee. I love the title of Executive Director of Accelerated and Extended Learning for Columbus City Schools. But I love all of what you're doing. It was very interesting when we, when I was looking for panelists, one of the things that jumped out at me was this whole concept of, of, of and I'm not going to say it right, mastery learning, mastery education. And you and when I watched that video, you you truly have put that into practice. So um, I know that you shared with us a kind of an overview of, of the program that you put in place at, at uh, Columbus City Schools. So if you wouldn't mind, we'll kind of step through that and, and give us an idea with our with the graphics that we'll bring up on the screen, exactly what the process was and, and that whole update that you gave. Yeah, thanks, Jeff. So one of the things, and, and I think all the other panelists have touch, touched on it in some way, is um, like all of them, uh, we were seeing some pretty significant engagement issues with our students coming out of the pandemic. And we knew that we had to do something different, that school, um, especially with as much virtual learning that students, is, uh, that students were engaging in, we had to do something different. We had to do something really innovative uh, for the summer with really the primary goal of summer, what we called, we didn't even call it summer school, we called it summer experience. And so we, leverage several partners, including the Corda Institute, particular at high school level, to really bring about, and Dr. Young touched on this, pro project-based learning. Um, but it wasn't just project-based learning in the sense of, you know, a science project 
or a project that focused on math skills. These were community-based projects um, where we leveraged partners um, to pose real world problems. So there was that relevance piece um, that again, some of the other panelists had talked about. So we embedded relevance um, and then those students um, went out into the community and they felt empowered um, that they were doing something that would help uh, their community. And, and I know in looking at some of the pictures, um, Nationwide Children's Hospital was a great partner. Um, you saw a local uh, TV station, NBC4. Um, I can tell you actually Columbus City Schools submitted one um, for a radio station that we had, WCBE. And there was an actual question posed, should we keep the radio station or should we sell it? And through that work that the students did, um, particularly around WCBE, um, they convinced uh, senior leadership and the board um, and the superintendent um, that there's a viable plan uh, for WCBE. And actually fast forward to March, um, where that plan actually started back in last July, um, we have a very viable plan um, for WCBE where we're actually partnering with the summit out of Akron. Um, and we've created this really great collaborative partnership um, between Columbus and um, the summit. And, and really that started with those students who did that project. So that, that's something that's really special and it's going to have a lasting impact and legacy. Kenny, as we now step through your next slide, and I think we're going to show, I'm, I'm not quite sure what we'll see on, on our next slide here, but we talk about this power of one. And I find it very interesting that I look over your shoulder and I see the power of one poster on your wall, which I think is wonderful. So talk a bit about about this whole concept and then we'll we'll step through your slides. Yeah, so the power of one is really um, the, the theme of our new strategic plan um, and really around the idea, um, focusing on the idea that it takes all of us. Um, it takes our partners, it takes our community stakeholders um, to really have that impact on accelerating um, the learning uh, for our students. It takes a village. Um, and especially with some of the impact that we've seen um, on our students learning, it's going to take all of us working together, working in concert um, to make sure that our students, um, no matter where they are. And I think in the video, it mentioned that there are some students um, that thrive during the, the during virtual learning. And we have those. There are also students who struggle. So it doesn't matter where you're at um, on that spectrum. We're going to work to um, accelerate your learning. Now, Kenny, as we move on, and this is kind of your, your whole concept here of a couple, of, uh, more than a couple of the different elements involved with this accelerated learning as you move into 2022, 2023. Uh, you want to talk a little bit about that? Sure. So this slide basically takes the power of one, the strategic plan and our three board goals, which is strengthening reading proficiency, closing opportunity gaps around graduation and developing portrait ready graduates. We have a, a big initiative in the district, our portrait of a graduate. Um, where we uh, really empowered the community to define six traits um, that we want all Columbus City School uh, students to graduate uh, with. And to your point, Jeff, about mastery, we want the, our students to master those six traits. And through that, uh, we've developed a series of initiatives, including uh, Power On, which actually um, incorporate some of what Emily showed and what Dr. Young showed about creating clubs and creating engagement activities, really focusing on student SEL um, and also academics. And, and really within those three, um, within those three areas, really trying to move our students and also our staff too, because um, we know that the, the pandemic had an impact on them as well. So we wanted to make sure this initiative focuses not just on students, but it also focuses on staff. So again, really going back to that idea of power of one. And, and then talk about the family literacy events. Yeah, so family literacy is actually in conjunction with our Pathway Express. And we know uh, one of the best ways to strengthen reading proficiency is to get books in the hands of our students. So one of the great things um, that academic services has done in Columbus City Schools is to put books into the hands of our families um, and into the hands of our students. And so we've partnered um, with a lot of community groups, including on there, you'll see COSI, which is a, a world-renowned science museum. Uh, we've done work with the Columbus Museum of Art, um, even the, a, a local um, 
a restaurant, the North Market, where they have a lot of vendors um, pushing entrepreneurship. Um, so we've really leveraged even our community partners to help us push this idea of um, increasing literacy um, and not just within our elementary students. This is something K-12 and even going again with our families. We want to really lean in on this idea of power of one, including our families. And as we move into some of the programs that you that as you dealt with your your secondary, your grade six through 12, you know, you talk about that summer experience. Um, I, we, you know, I I love the term, you know, summer experience instead of summer school. Um, so talk just a, a bit about that and we'll move to the next slide and 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 talk about that. All <laughs> yeah. So, again, for this year, um, we have a we have a big goal um, that. Again, Dr. Dixon continues to push the envelope in, in all the great ways. And so we have a target of, of enrolling 10,000 students in our summer experience um, on, a, on a K-12 and really developing programming um, that students are going to be interested in. And again, I think some of the panelists alluded, it's, it's hard to get students to engage in summer, um, summer learning, but we believe that if we create innovative, engaging, um, programs and, and I think one of the, in the video they mentioned it where students are learning and they don't even realize they're learning that's really the key and so that's where um, we're really developing programs for our summer experience incorporating things like robotics incorporating career pathways um, college credit plus bridge programs to help prepare our students for that next step um, into post-secondary um, all of these things we have an outdoor learning center um, that we have where students, again, who have been inside so much just to be outside and, and enjoy the outdoors. These are the, the um, things we're really looking at. And as I mentioned, here are the six traits for a portrait of a graduate. These are the six traits we want our students to graduate with. But these are also the six traits that form the foundation of our summer experience. And so every program that we have incorporates um, one, if not all of these, uh, in some form or fashion. And so this is where we really want to develop alignment um, and coherence with everything we do in the district. I have to say it's it's a wonderful program. I, I love what, not only what, Kenny, what you've talked about, but what our other panelists talk about on, on how everyone is dealing a little bit differently um, with that whole pandemic learning loss, especially with our high school students. So I appreciate all of the panelists tonight as we're wrapping things up. Um, I thank all of you uh, for uh, that are remote, that uh, are attending our continuing series of webinars. Um, we continue to focus on those best, best practices in closing the pandemic learning gap in our schools. Um, we truly appreciate all of the panelists tonight and what they, what they shared. Um, this webinar will be part of the resources available uh, on our project website um, with the URL that you see at the bottom of your screen. We also create a series of podcasts. So we have done an elementary series and a middle school series, and we've had some wonderful podcasts that support that. So, um, and those all take a little deeper dive. Uh, they can also be found on our project website. I've changed up the schedule a bit in our next webinar, which will focus on the work that our school districts are doing to combat that pandemic learning gap as students move from high school to college. That will take place on Wednesday, April 20th from 6 to 7 o'clock. Please join us then. Once again, we thank the Broadcast Educational Media Commission in collaboration with the Ohio Department of Education. Without them, we would not have made this project possible, but also if it wasn't for the great panelists that we've had, especially this evening. I'm Jeff Good from PBS Western Reserve. From the staff of PBS Western Reserve, we thank you for your time viewing. We appreciate our panelists, and we hope to see you in attendance at future webinars. Have a great night, everyone.